Sorry, Takimova, and I will be your moderator for this topic session. This session has been recorded. It will be available with all the materials by the link later. Please feel comfortable asking questions. Put your questions in the chart. We answer them at the end of the presentation. Please let me introduce the speaker. Peter Foldazi worked at large fintech companies. He will declare the page object pattern as widely known and use the mouse test automation engineers. It allows engineers to model the application for their tests using certain elements, making the test solution more structured and hence decreasing maintenance cost and the learning curve of test automation. From a tester's point of view, it could be improved. Moreover, it breaks the single responsibility principle, which has been one of its most criticized flaws. That's why the flow model pattern was created. In this approach, the structure of the application is separated from the logic. All the user flaws are stored in these new models, creating a facet over the page objects. Peter will go through the technical details, comparing the two approaches, and will talk about the main differences of the BI layer and the two. Uh, layer architectures. I pass the word to Peter. Please, Peter, start the presentation. Thank you very much and uh, thank you very much for the really nice music. It uh, definitely uh, made me pumped up uh, for this presentation. And uh, yeah, uh, so as mentioned, uh, I'm Peter Fultazi Jr. Uh, and I'm uh, from Hungary, currently working for EPAM US. And uh, actually, I have a little bit of story because right now I'm in Croatia in a, in kind of a, a half vacation, half uh, travel. I, I don't even know how to call that because uh, of the whole COVID situation. We were stuck in Hungary when we visited family. So right now we are trying to get back to the US and um, when uh, I heard about the QAC days uh, and that it's going to be in July when we plan to go back, I already knew that I will be at a, a really nice place uh, uh, making this presentation. So I'm already feeling really happy and I hope that uh, I can give this positivity uh, to all of you as well in this uh, uh, hard situation. Uh, and I hope that you are going to get more than just positivity, but also uh, learn something new. So uh, what I'm going to talk uh, about uh, is, uh, is basically a comparison of two concepts. And uh, one of them is widely used uh, in test automation. So a little bit more about myself. So I've been with EPAM a, a little bit over eight years and I've been in engineering for about 10 years now. And um, I've been doing mostly test automation and testing uh, and mostly mobile uh, field, but also desktop and web uh, testing as well. Uh, API, UI, unit testing, so all levels of, uh, of the testing pyramid. And I would like to share my experience with you. So uh, the agenda today is uh, going to be about all design patterns. So first, uh, talking about uh, generally about design patterns, then the page object pattern, and the and uh, I think what is the the main topic today, uh, the flow model, and uh, how you can incorporate into UI test automation, and not just in UI, but uh, a little bit in API testing as well. So let's get started and uh, let me uh, talk about design patterns. So obviously, as I don't know how advanced uh, my audience is, because I know that there are, uh, there are several thousands of you uh, who registered to this uh, conference, uh, which is really uh, heart uh, warming for me. So I hope uh, that I can uh, make it, uh, make you understand if, even if you don't have much testing or test automation experience. I try to show uh, the basics as well and quickly uh, jumping to to higher levels. So first of all, let me talk about the gang of four design patterns because whenever we talk about design patterns, then the most of the time we right away think about the gang of four design patterns. So uh, the book by Gamma, Han, Johnson and Residus uh, was published in 1994 where they showed uh, 23 different design patterns and, um, and basically they decided to do that because they realized there were 
patterns uh, whenever uh, they, uh, they uh, started working on a, a new project, whenever they designed uh, their next uh, application or set of applications, they realized that uh, uh, there are certain uh, problems, programmatic problems, for which they can uh, reuse previously uh, written uh, uh, algorithms or uh, solutions. And uh, so they call them design patterns that they uh, they uh, released because this is something that uh, is going to be uh, useful for basically any programmer in the world. And uh, we as test automation engineers, we are not just testers, but also uh, software engineers who have to uh, design test architectures and implement uh, the test solutions. And uh, my favorite pattern is the facet pattern. And the reason for that is because it's really, really useful in test automation. And I believe that uh, without it, uh, there's uh, there's no real test automation at all. And uh, so let me give you a testing example. Let's say that uh, you have a test layer with all sorts of different test cases, and they are all uh, login or mostly login related uh, uh, cases here. And uh, let's say that uh, you have your uh, page models, and uh, whatever you store there, the, the, the objects of the pages, uh, you would hide them in a facet called login flow, and by doing so, you are not going to directly interact with pages, you are directly going to interact with the flows. In this case, the login flow. And uh, this is basic, the login flow is basically creating a facet over the pages. Uh, so why is it uh, good for us? Because uh, it makes the library more readable. It's going to hide implementation details and it's going to be easier to maintain and uh, learn uh, the uh, whole concept and maintain uh, these libraries if you if you follow this uh, strategy. Uh, so going onwards, I already mentioned that uh, there are a lot of design patterns and when we talk about design patterns, normally we uh, talk about the gang of four design patterns, but uh, there are test automation specific design patterns as well. And the most known and most widely used one is the page object pattern. So <laughs> before we can really jump into the details, uh, I, I know that there might be some of you who don't know what the, what the page object is. So for you to understand, uh, let's first uh, look at this piece of code. So when you look at it, do you know, honestly, do you know what this is about? Of course, you look at it and you see that it's a login test. So probably it's some kind of a login test. You don't know if it's a successful one or it's an unsuccessful scenario or which one of those unsuccessful scenarios. You just know that it's a, it's a login test. You're going to uh, have to read through all the lines to be able to understand that you click, uh, uh, that you uh, open a login page probably. And then uh, you're going to type in a username, uh, Darth Vader and so on. So it takes a little bit more time for you to understand uh, this piece of code. And whenever I see and or more like hear people still using this unstructured uh, approach, that makes me sad. And yeah, uh, I unfortunately still hear that people in 2020 are using this kind of approach and uh, which is kind of okay, uh, or actually it's, it is okay if you are doing a, P, uh, a POC, a proof of concept, because there you don't really have time to make a structured or not necessarily have the time to create a structured uh, uh, test automation. Well, what you want to do is, uh, is prove that you can uh, automate tests for a certain product or set of products, or you can use a certain tool or framework uh, in your project. Uh, but if you have already 10 test cases or especially 100,000 or thousands of test cases, uh, it's going to be a nightmare it's, and it's going to be impossible to continue test automation with such an approach. So that's where the page object comes in because with page object, it is possible. It is actually very easy to uh, to have a test automation solution, even with several thousands of test cases. And why is that? Because 
uh, what it offers is is having a, a page, a class file for each of the pages and modeling these pages and only storing each of the, uh, the objects that you are going to interact with during your test automation. So whatever you are going to test, you are going to store in those page models. Uh, this way, if uh, let's say that one of the items uh, changes, let's say the name of the speaker changes here, you only have to change it at one place or uh, the locator of, uh, of an element over here changes. Then you only have to uh, change it uh, at one place. So you don't have to change it in 50 different test cases, you only change it at the page model. So that is an obvious uh, win for us test automation engineers. But um, if you read uh, uh, the description of this talk, uh, in the description you could find that uh, uh, I wasn't happy with the page object pattern and um, there are several reasons for it and the probably the main reason and uh, the reason why many others are not happy or fully happy with the page object is because uh, the page object is breaking one of the uh, solid principles. So for those who don't know what the solid principles are, so solid principles um, are also very, very important in, uh, in software uh, design, just like the design patterns or, or the objective oriented principles. Uh, those who are uh, on junior or meteor level, uh, sometimes even seniors uh, don't know what uh, the solid principles are. And I think it's fine at the beginning of your career, but if you would like to advance as a test automation engineer, you need to learn more about uh, programming as well and, and program concepts. And solid principles are very, very useful. Uh, and uh, one of them is called the single responsibility. And um, so the page object is breaking the single responsibility. And what is this principle about? Basically, if you look at uh, these over here, uh, so these represent uh, one class, a class where you have a rectangular, a triangle and a, a circle. And uh, if you would like to make any changes in the circle, you have to make a change in the whole class because the circle is part of that class. So uh, that is uh, not a good thing because first of all, your class is going to grow bigger because it has three different uh, uh, things inside. And, uh, and uh, second, uh, if you screw up something and accidentally make changes that affect any of the uh, other shapes, uh, then that's going to cause a bug. Of course, uh, uh, what you can do is separate them into three different class files and whenever you make changes in the circle, it's going to affect only the circle itself. Now, this is a very, very uh, simple uh, uh, description of the single responsibility and uh, a simple example, but of course, uh, in the real life uh, with, with huge uh, systems, uh, there might be robust uh, classes and uh, classes that are really difficult to maintain. And um, so when we talk about changes, it's a little bit, well, not just a little bit, but way more difficult to understand what changes may affect uh, uh, those uh, classes and which parts of those classes. So this concept, uh, the uh, separation of constant existed a long time ago, but the person who, who declared uh, what the single responsibility is, uh, is Uncle Bob and, and he, he published it at the end of the 90s. And uh, he was asked many times, okay, we understand that we have to separate the concerns and we have to separate methods or, or classes, but uh, what is the reason for change? Uh, how do I understand uh, understand that if I need to change something in the circle, then I only need to make that change in that circle? Uh, so how, how, how do I understand that? And in 2014, so six years ago, he said that actually uh, from his experience, change comes from a single person or a group of people. So that helps in understanding 
why the page object is breaking the single responsibility. Uh, and you might argue with, uh, with my list over here, and uh, you might say that, okay, uh, actions are decided by the business, or you might say that they are decided by the testers. Uh, and I'm really, uh, really curious to hear your opinion uh, or which parts uh, are, are decided uh, by whom. Uh, in my opinion, uh, locators and elements, as they are uh, developed by developers, uh, the, uh, they are the ones who decide if there is any change. If they change uh, uh, the HTML DOM, then uh, the locators are going to change as well, and therefore the elements as well. So, us as testers, we decide what we are going to test. Of course, the business has their saying as well, uh, and uh, and the user flows, how exactly we are going to test uh, them, in what order, uh, and uh, how, how deeply. So even if we say that uh, it's just the developers and the testers who decide uh, the changes, it's still two, uh, two uh, different uh, group of people. So that means that we have to separate uh, the page objects into two. And uh, I like this uh, picture a lot because it really sums up why breaking the single responsibility is bad. Uh, so of course, uh, a Swiss knife uh, comes uh, handy all the time, but uh, and having uh, a different kind of Swiss knives, uh, people have different uh, um, expectations from a, sw a Swiss knife. But are you going to be able to hold all that stuff uh, in your pocket? No, this is, you don't have such a big pocket. And even if you did, would you be able to find what you were looking for, that exact uh, knife or that exact uh, bottle opener or whatever? Uh, it, it might take a while for you, even if you've been owning this, uh, uh, this uh, knife for several months now. So that's why breaking the single responsibility is, is not good for you. And that's why uh, following uh, the page object uh, uh, is not good uh, for test automation, in my humble opinion. And that's how uh, seven years ago I came up with the flow model pattern because seven years ago I started working on an uh, iOS project or mobile project first on the iOS part and uh, I I was the one to create the test automation solution for two IS uh, products. And uh, I started out first using the page object and I wasn't fully satisfied. And that's that's when I started thinking how I could, could enhance it. And um, if I had to uh, describe uh, what, what the flow model is, and I'm doing that right now. So uh, the easiest way for me is is to uh, show it uh, as an as a UML diagram, as a state machine diagram. So if you know what the state machine diagram is, then you're going to immediately recognize uh, that this is basically a state machine diagram. So how does it look like? In the state machine diagram, you have states and transitions. So you have the screen models over here, or page models. You can call them however you like. My example is going to be a mobile example, an Android example. So you have uh, your screens as the states, because when you are on a screen, you landed that, that's where you are, that's your state in the application. And whenever you do an action, then that's a, a, a transition from one screen to another, from the main screen, you can transit to the login screen by clicking on the login button, opening the login screen. And if you click on the username, type your, uh, and then type it, then you click on the password and type it, then uh, you're not going to transit to another, uh, uh, another state, to another screen. You're going to still remain there. It's just uh, the text that are going to change. The uh, text fields, or the edit text are going to hold the username that you typed in. And once you click uh, continue button or login button, then uh, you land on your profile screen if everything went well, and then you can do whatever you want. You can edit your own profile, or if uh, you can make transactions, you can make transactions or start workouts if it's a, a, a fit uh, application, a fitness application, uh, whatever the domain is. And then once you are ready, then you can log out by clicking on the login button and land on the main screen again. 
but uh, that is uh, not enough. So of course, for understanding the flow model concept, this is enough, but uh, for for understanding the nuances and how to properly do flow model design, uh, we need to ask some questions. So of course, on the main screen, if it's a, a mobile application, where do I find the login button? Or where do I find the back button? Is it the physical back button or is it software uh, digital back button? Or is, uh, where is the login uh, lookout button on the profile screen? So it depends on the design, of course. So you have a navigation bar on your uh, in your mobile application. So maybe your login button is there, or maybe you have to open the, the hamburger menu first and you can look, uh, look out over there uh, or press a back button over there or a physical back button. It's all up to design. So in my, uh, this example, how it looks like on the main screen, you can tap the side menu button, the hamburger button. Uh, that button is on the toolbar, which so that's where you are going to reach that. Then the menu button and uh, menu is going to open up. Then you will be able to tap on the login button, uh, which means uh, that you are going to get to the login screen and do the same thing uh, as you did uh, in the previous example. Uh, log in, do whatever you want on your profile. Then once you log out, maybe it's uh, directly on the toolbar or maybe it's part of the menu. So you first have to open the menu again and log out there and you land on the main screen. So why did I mention this? Because uh, this is not a new concept. So Selenium users already know that there are widgets uh, on each side that, that uh, might be reused on several different pages or pop-ups that might uh, pop up on different pages as well. Uh, so you need to uh, have separate class files for these. Storing them uh, on each of the different uh, screens is uh, not a good approach. So you need to have separate class files for uh, these widgets as well. If you do that, you are going to he have a much uh, more detailed uh, state machine diagram. And this way you will be understand to, you will be able to understand your application much better and how to test it properly and hence how to uh, design a proper test automation for it and proper flow models. So going on what, let's uh, look at this trial error architecture and let, I, I'm just hoping that this is how uh, most of you do it as well, that you have a common library, uh, an application uh, with application and project in, uh, independent uh, libraries. You have the test layers with the test suits and the test cases, and inside you have the business layer. There you have the flow models and the structure models. So how it looks like, uh, the flow model is uh, essentially a facet over the structure models and the test cases are going to directly make calls from the flow models and the flow models are going to make directly calls from the structure models and uh, from the common libraries. And uh, for making it easier for, for all of you to understand it, I'm going to give you an example with uh, code snippets as well. So uh, this is the previously shown uh, trial layer architecture with a core layer, business layer and test layer. Here you can see a lone base test and uh, of course the screen and widget uh, models are going to make their calls from the base test, just like how the login flow is also going to be able to reach the base test and is a screen and widgets as well. And the login test is only going to make calls directly from the login flow. Uh, in more complex uh, test cases, uh, there might be calls from other flows as well. This is a, a more simple uh, example for making it easier uh, to understand the concept. So let's uh, look at uh, how, how to build uh, flow models first. What you need is you need your locators and you need to create your elements or, or if it's a, an Android example, just like this one, then views. So how it looks like. Uh, so on in Android, you have the resource IDs. There are other ways as well. You can create uh, locators or you can locate elements, uh, but resource ID is the mostly used and uh, easiest if, if it exists. And uh, so here, 
I have uh, the login screen. I have the username, login button, password, and show password. I need to create, of course, the home screen and these widgets as well. And once I have them, uh, I can always uh, uh, update them over here if necessary, if there is any change in the application and how you locate elements. The next uh, step is now you are able to create a test uh, using uh, these uh, uh, objects uh, from all, all these different screen models, uh, but you still have to call uh, the click and type uh, and all sorts of other actions on these uh, uh, objects. So you are able to uh, open uh, the menu, uh, menu, then click on the login button inside the uh, side menu. Uh, once the login uh, uh, screen opened, then you are able to type in your username your password, uh, continue uh, uh, with final login in, then waiting for the home screen to open up, uh, then validating that it opened up actually, and that uh, the correct one uh, was opened up. So I was uh, welcomed as Darth Vader. So uh, this is how it looks like, and it's, it's already pretty neat and readable and uh, maintainable. But by introducing uh, flow models, uh, we can uh, make it even easier to understand uh, the tests and the test steps and to make them easier to maintain. So what it looks like is basically the previous steps, uh, uh, what you could see the steps in on the previous page, I'm just moving them under uh, login uh, steps. So uh, I have a, an open login screen. I'm typing my username. See how I have two steps under each other here. here. Type my password, then finishing the login. I'm not really uh, interested here uh, about the details how I, I finished the login. I just want to go on and finish it. And uh, this is how uh, the test it will itself will look like. I open the side menu. I open uh, the login screen, type my username, password, finish the login, uh, open the sign menu, and then log out. Just like uh, two slides ago, it's the same thing. It's going to do the same thing, uh, but let's be honest, for a tester, if you look at it, you can right away see that it's a, it's a login scenario, and you can see exactly what steps you are uh, doing here. And uh, with this, it is way easier for anybody to understand it. Uh, let's say that I uh, work on a test uh, automation solution and half a year later I need to uh, update uh, many of the uh, test cases. Uh, if I haven't looked at it uh, in ages or half a year, it's uh, going to be more difficult for me to understand unless I'm using uh, the flow uh, model design. This way I can immediately understand what the test uh, does. And uh, I think this one speaks for itself. So let me compare this, uh, the three different uh, design aspects. So unstructured is obviously very long and is difficult to understand and is in the long run impossible to uh, maintain. Uh, using the page object uh, modeling concept, uh, it's already maintainable, much easier to understand and read. Uh, but the problem here is that uh, the flows themselves, if they change, uh, you, you still have to change them in uh, the separate different test cases. Uh, first of all, second, it is still easier, way easier to understand this uh, uh, test case over here and quicker compared to this one over here under the page model version. And uh, going on to the last section of my presentation, uh, I'm going to show you how to incorporate uh, this uh, design concept in API testing as well. It is very, very important to, for me to note that originally I uh, invented the flow model for UI test automation. And later uh, on, I realized that it can be used in API testing as well. This does not mean that you can use it in and, and should use it in uh, all of your uh, API testing. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, what I would highlight here 
that it's effective only in end-to-end -end API testing, not uh, inside subsystems uh, API testing and not atomic uh, API testing. I think in such scenarios, in such project uh, setups, uh, you shouldn't use a uh, flow model uh, at all. Uh, in case it's, it's a, a long end-to-end -end testing that you are doing, then you're going to benefit a lot from using the flow model uh, design. So basically how you should uh, think about it is that uh, you, you don't have UI anymore, but instead you have, have APIs. And uh, instead of uh, having uh, UI steps, you have API calls as steps. So you can think of them as, as those are your test steps. So that means if we jump back to the client layer architecture and we only focus on the business layer again, you can see that we have the flow models over here, but instead of the structured models, because you don't have a UI anymore, you have APIs instead. Uh, you should have utility classes and the flow models are going to call from the utility classes and the flow models are going to be a facet over the utility classes now instead of uh, structure models, page models or screen models. So, uh, to sum it up, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, mention that page object is uh, is right now the most popular uh, and most well-known uh, test automation design pattern for a very, very good reason. And it helped uh, us uh, improve our test automation by not just a little bit, but by a huge margin. Uh, and, and that was probably the biggest step or one of the biggest steps in uh, UI test automation history. Uh, on the other hand, there are some issues with it. And uh, the flow model offers uh, a solution or a better, uh, better alternative. Uh, and this is what you can see here. So the, uh, the flow model is not breaking the single responsibility anymore, unlike the page object uh, pattern. Uh, the page object is also using facet, uh, by the way, but uh, the flow model is, is uh, offering another facet and uh, which makes it easier to read uh, the libraries and it uh, makes uh, people to understand uh, the whole test solution easier. Hence, it is uh, quicker to uh, ramp up new people on the project and uh, they can be uh, productive earlier and with a higher productivity. Also, this means that uh, maintenance is, uh, costs are going to be lowered because it's not just the 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 objects now that are being stored at one place, but also the steps and complex user flows as well. If you need to change a user flow that you are going to use in several different uh, test cases, for example, you are going to log in uh, 500 times out of uh, 600 test cases. You don't have to change the login flow itself in 500 different test cases. You just going to change the, uh, the flow model uh, at that place. And the last one is that uh, flow model is also offering uh, a solution that you can use in end-to-end -end, uh, API testing, not just in UI testing anymore. So my conclusion is that uh, the page object is good if you are using it. It's good, it's awesome. If you think that, uh, or if you feel that it could be improved, uh, then I hope I could help. And uh, I'm, I'm really, really, really thinking that, that this is going to help a lot of you. And uh, if uh, you want some more help, if you would like to get some more details, of course, we are going to have a Q&A session now. So you are going to be able to ask questions, but if you need uh, longer answers uh, or if you have a, a more difficult situation where you need some help, uh, some ideas, then uh, you can always approach me. I'm, I'm really socializable. I'm really happy to talk to people. I'm really happy to have. So there are many ways uh, to find me. First of all, you can hook me up at my uh, EPAM address. Just 
write me an email that uh, you you have a test solution and and you need some ideas how you could improve that or uh, you could uh, just uh, connect me through linkedin uh, i'm really happy to have engineering discussions on linkedin as well uh, or if you are just interested in uh, a little piece of my personal life where <laughs> where we are traveling you can find me on instagram as well and if you would like to listen to my other videos uh, um, other presentations you can find them on YouTube. Just search for me, Peter Fultazi, and there I have an account uh, with some of my videos uploaded. So thank you again for being here uh, with me, with us, and uh, I ho again hope uh, you enjoyed uh, this presentation. I myself enjoyed being here, and I'm all ears. <laughs> so please ask all of your questions. Thank you very much for your presentation, Peter. You did really great. Your experience is amazing. Take a breath. Thank you. Oh yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> we get a lot of questions for you to answer, so let me just read it. Okay. The most voted question comes from Branko. Why the locators and elements have to be the developer's responsibility only? What about the collaboration with the quality assurance tester? Thank you very much for that uh, question. Uh, it's a good point. Uh, actually, it depends on projects as well. So I had projects uh, where I was a responsible person for uh, creating the locators, actually. Uh, it was an IS project and uh, I was the one mostly not all the time but mostly i was the one who uh, added the accessibility accessibility identifiers for each of the elements um, so that's that's a that's a good thing that you brought up so it can be uh, the responsibility of a tester but uh, in many cases we see uh, that unfortunately it's either not feasible because the test automation engineers uh, have already enough work to to do and they don't have enough capacity to even cover this uh, part. So the developers need to do that. Or there are cases and, uh, and unfortunately I hear many such uh, situations uh, where, uh, where the developers won't give that, uh, that uh, opportunity for testers or or it's just simply not possible because uh, only developers may have access to the code. Uh, let's say uh, uh, you have a client that you are working for and only the client is allowed to access uh, the code. Uh, in one of my uh, projects, uh, that was the scenario. Uh, I wasn't allowed to, uh, to access uh, the code uh, of the application. Uh, I got the application uh, through test flight and hence I was able to only do black box testing, 100% black box testing more difficult scenario but it is what it is so we have to prepare for that uh, i hope that uh, this was uh, enough answer for you uh, i i understand uh, the situation that you asked and that is a valid situation thank you peter okay we have another question from our participants uh alexei um asks you about um, do you know test flows uh, test flows are also defined by business yes okay <laughs> that's, that's a, yeah and uh, that's a, why and uh, again thank you very much for bringing this up but this is uh, something that i also wanted to highlight uh, probably i didn't highlight it uh, well enough that uh, flows test flows can be uh, decided by business as well and to be honest Obviously, that's the best case scenario when uh, the business already uh, decides not uh, not just what the acceptance criteria are, uh, and not just which which we can use for atomic test cases, but also more complex uh, scenarios or uh, or user flows. Uh, this is really helpful for testers. Mm, sometimes it is the case. And it is very good for us, test automation engineers and testers, because that uh, uh, then we have more time for other uh, jobs to do as well, not just uh, test uh, definition, but test uh, case implementation and so on. Uh, but that's not always the scenario. Thank you, Peter. Let's move on to the next question. 
uh, what do you think about user interface objects pattern used in JDI? Yeah. Oh, uh, again, thank you very much for this uh, question. And uh, yes, uh, recently, uh, so when I, okay, let me slow down a little bit because I want to say too many things. So uh, originally when I started uh, working on this presentation, I actually wanted to have uh, uh, more uh, design patterns mentioned as well. And uh, one of, uh, so I mentioned the one used in JDI as well, which is very uh, important actually. And uh, this is a plan of mine that later on I want to uh, expand uh, this presentation and include uh, this design pattern as well. Uh, so right now I thought that as a first step, let's just call it as a first step, I would just uh, simply compare it to page object. And as a next step uh, I, in, in the future, hopefully this year or next year, uh, either again on, on a, uh, on a uh, Z conference or at uh, another uh, online conference, hopefully I can talk about uh, uh, more deeply about test automation uh, design patterns as well. So that concept is actually is similar in many ways to the flow model. It's a little bit uh, different, uh, but I think it ad addresses uh, many of the issues with page object as well. So that is the reason why I would like to pick that up as well in the future. Thank you, Peter. Really, it was a great question as well. <laughs> Okay, just a quick reminder to our audience, don't be shy to ask questions, please. If you want something to clarify, please share your questions and put them on the QA panel. It says here, it's a question from Branko. Can we achieve the same thing using DSL uh, plus POM, page object model instead of flow model pattern? Uh, basically, uh, what I wanted to say. So basically, uh, yes, you can. You can even think about that DSL as a flow model. So it depends on how exactly you are implementing. If you are implementing it that way, uh, then you can uh, basically uh, use it the same way. It's just a different way of how you are uh, writing your test code. That's how I think I personally, so and the re uh, reason why, again, I li like that this was brought up is uh, because seven years ago when we were thinking that, okay, this page object modeling might not be the best uh, approach for us. Uh, we brought, uh, so one of the developers brought up that uh, uh, using DSL might be beneficial for us. And uh, I think it's good. I think it's useful. I personally like this app, uh, write, writing the test cases this way better because I like to go from top to bottom. Uh, while And I hope that I understand uh, how you meant uh, it, but uh, if you are writing it from left to right, uh, one step and, uh, after another, uh, then I, that's reading from the left to right. Basically, we can say that it's the same thing or could be done the same way. The benefit of the DSL is that uh, uh, it gives you a direction where you can go. Uh, so that's again, uh, might be a little bit uh, easier actually for those who don't have uh, coding experience or don't have much coding experience. So that is a, a more useful approach for those who, who need some guidance at the beginning. That's that's how I see it. I myself have more coding experience, so that hence I like I like to go to top to bottom. That, that's it. Okay, thank you, Peter. So next question goes from Laszlo Szigzai. Uh, he asks you about, in your opinion, what is the project size or scope when it does not worth to use page object, or we must use it always? Uh, page object or flow model? I think both of them. Yeah, probably it's easier to to answer that this way. So I think if it's a small project, uh, a very very small, then uh, and uh, and then probably it's just easier to go with uh, page objects. Uh, flow models is going to give you uh, a, a huge uh, benefit only if you are reusing the flaws. 
if you are only using each of the uh, steps, uh, especially each of the flows only once in your whole test suit, then it's still useful because it's, it gives you abstractions. So I still like to use flow models uh, then as well. Uh, but if you need to hurry uh, with implementation, you don't have much time to implement uh, all the flow, uh, flows and it's a small project, then it's just better to this uh, flow model in that case and only go with uh, page objects. OK, thank you, Peter. The next question comes from Zoltan Keys. What is your opinion about to combine the flow model with Jorkin? It could be give more advantage to the test automation framework. Uh, yes, actually, I, I did it uh, last year uh, for my client that I was working uh, last year in O'Fallon. And uh, so, and that was an API uh, end to end testing project, actually. So, uh, what we did is basically we had the utilities uh, for uh, where we uh, stored uh, all the basic actions and all the API calls, uh, the single API calls and more complex API calls. Uh, then we had the flow models for each of the uh, the complex scenarios and what we did is instead of having let's say a login that uh, open uh, login uh, page uh, we instead had uh, given when then uh, scenario so we had uh, the given steps or given parts we had the when parts we had the then parts uh, it's a little bit uh, different because in the flow model it is allowed for you to combine the when and then steps uh, into one, one, uh, one flow on one step. In uh, when you are using Yorkin uh, and you want to do it properly, then obviously you're going to have the action uh, inside the when, and you are going to have the assertion, the validation inside the then. So you have to uh, slice it up. So that's the main difference here. Of course, it's uh, if if you have uh, a very active uh, business and uh, business analyst or product owner who are providing all the uh, all the acceptance criteria and more complex user flows, using combining Gherkin together with flow model is very very beneficial for test automation. Thank you, Peter. It was amazing question about Gherkin. Okay. Uh, Jara, um, Jara Rule Shake uh, Shake's asking you what are the tools available for Flow Mono? Mm, I'm thinking what uh, what uh, he means. I guess he so uh, what he means by tools. So uh, something that is uh, already uh, downloadable on Git or uh, what tool do you think of? Could you please? Uh, uh, tell me more details about that because if you think about tools, basically uh, the flow model is uh, not a tool but a concept, so a design concept. This is up to you uh, how you implement it. So uh, if you are using uh, the flow model, that's a way you organize your test solution. That's a way you organize your test libraries, and that's a way you call. Uh, from the test libraries and how your test uh, scripts are going to look like. OK, thank you, Peter. Uh, the next question is, uh, it says here, what uh, what should not be included in page object? Mm -hmm. OK, so basically uh, how it looks like in page objects, you should have the locators and the web elements. I'm talking about uh, a web example right now. So you have the locators and the web elements. Uh, in the page object pattern, you also have uh, the actions uh, there as well. When you click on that certain web element, when you type a text into a text uh, field or an edit text, uh, or when you would like to assert that you landed on that page, all these things are going to be on, in one place. In the flow model concept, however, uh, you slice it up and in the page model or screen model, however you call it, you are going to have only the structures, only the locators and the elements. 
you are not going to have any actions. All the actions uh, are uh, stored inside the flow models. So uh, whenever you click, you uh, write the click uh, function over there and you uh, make a call to that uh, page object. Uh, so you are referencing to that uh, object that you can find in the page model. And uh, that's what you are going to interact with. And uh, you are going to have multiple of these uh, these uh, calls. You are going to have calls from other other uh, pages as well. And uh, you can concatenate these actions into flows. That's how it looks like. OK, Peter, thank you. Uh, the most popular questions are over, but uh, Laszlo uh, asks again um, about what's the project size scope when it does not was to use page object. We must use it always. I mean in use interface tests. So it's uh, again very similar to the previous question. Can you please tell it again to me so that I understand the difference between the two questions? OK, uh, what is the project size and scope when it does not was to use page object? We must use it always just in user interface uh, tests or in other tests. Uh, OK, I hope I understood it uh, and uh, last of sorry if uh, I didn't if I didn't understand your question properly, please hook me up uh, after the presentation uh, if I didn't uh, understand it correctly. But what I understand from this, so basically if you are doing a, a POC, then it's not necessarily important, but I guess you are not asking that question. I know that you know it exactly, so I'm I, uh, that's why I'm a little bit confused because I guess uh, you are asking, you want to want to know something else, and I, I sorry that I don't understand uh, what exactly you, you mean with this question. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yes. So. Thank you, Peter. Laszlo said, uh, sorry, it was just a comment to the original question. <laughs> ah, okay, okay. <laughs> so it's uh, cool. Oh. OK, thank you, Peter. I want to thank you. Thank our audience for the questions. We have great upcoming topics for our conference today. I can remind you this session has been recorded. It will be available with all the materials by the link later. I would like to thank our speaker for the excellent talk and thank you for your participation in the Community Z QA Z days in this topic session. It has been a pleasure meeting you here. I welcome you to move on to the next topic session. Have a great day. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.